first thing I gotta say is, is this working? Yeah. Any, anyone who has a microphone is, is this working? Is this on? And they tap it like mad. Well, actually, um, I don't deal as much with sound as I do with presentation. Maybe presentation of sound, but it's but that's the real thrust of it. It's almost like you've got to capture the people's attention and have some impact in order to be noticed. And I'm doing that with music. I'm doing that dealing with music. Um, but this could apply to the visual arts, could apply to uh, theater, could apply to comedians, uh, anything like that. Anyway, let's, let me hit some slides here. That's me, if you haven't noticed. Uh, and that's the studio. The, um, I basically started out, let me, uh, well, first of all, this is really weird, because sort of like, if you would have said 40 years ago that we'd be talking about punk music now, I would say you're absolutely crazy. I mean, you know, it's got to be some sort of fad that's going to pass over and, you know, just like you know, all the other things are happening. But we are. And it evolved. And it evolved tremendously. So, um, next to a very cutesy one. That's not it. But that's what we're talking about, sort of. There it is. Um, I started out, I started out, um, I'm going to start sort of back a long time ago. Um, how I got involved in this, how I got involved in presentation as an art. I, um, I was kind of an unruly child in a lot of different ways. I was the kind that, when, and this is a true story, parents took me to an a Italian restaurant, you know, with the, the lions and the fountain, and the, you know, the water falling out of their mouths and everything like that. And I was young, very, very young. I excused myself, went over to the fountains, took off my shoes and socks, and started wading in there, digging out the coins from the fountain. <laughs> And, well, that was the end of dinner for, for a <laughs> lot of reasons. But um, around 10 years old, they had the unique idea that a lot of parents have, I guess, I should take music lessons. And this is in upstate New York, Rochester, in an old Polish community. Um, and uh, so they took me to the music store and uh, anybody who knows anything about Polish music knows there is one king instrument and that's the accordion and uh, so I you know it seemed like I was destined to take the accordion up uh, but I was saved because Elvis Presley was coming on the scene and he had this guitar and he was playing it. Now, up to this point, the only people who played guitar were the cowboys. And um, cowboys and, and, and blues singers. So the guitar was sort of way back there in the background. But he was an actual popular singer who was playing guitar. And I said, well, I'm going to take guitar. I don't want to call you in. So I took that for a while. I, was all right, did pretty good. And a friend of mine, 
uh, took it afterwards, which helped out quite a bit. And after a couple years, I sort of dropped off and it sort of bored me. And uh, I put it away, put it in the closet for a while. And I didn't do anything about it for, for a long time. And my friend came over one night and he said, hey, let's, uh, you know, why don't you pull out your guitar? You still got it, don't you? I said, yeah. And uh, he said, this new group, the Beatles, is on the scene. And, you know, I could teach you some songs. And you know, I said, I, you know, I, I haven't played for a while. I hate playing chords. I can't play them. My fingers don't go in the right places and all that. But he took it out and it was interesting. And the, and the songs were compelling. And I started playing again. And long story short, I got into playing, got into bands, um, didn't have money for amplifiers. I got an electric guitar, but no amplifier. So what we did was we, friends of mine, we went around and on trash day, those old Magnavox consoles, you know, those things that are about six feet long with oak cabinets and everything like that that had amplifiers there. And people throw them out for some reason. We'd <laughs> grab those things and we'd turn them into guitar amplifiers with the help of some friends of mine who uh, were very good in electronics. And it intrigued me. Uh, this, was, this was amazing. This is amazing that you could just, you could transform these things into something else. And they said, hey, you've got a tape recorder too. We can make that a guitar amplifier. Wow, it's amazing. And they showed me how you just solder these things together and you put it together. Well, I went through that and then into high school, more bands, more music. Um, into college, I decided to go into art school and college. Um, I'm still very much interested in tape recorders and electronics and things like that. Uh, and at the end of four years of college, uh, there was a thing, probably, probably a few of you guys out here remember, there was a draft lottery. Does anybody remember the draft lottery? No, you're too young, definitely too young. <laughs> well, it was, what it was was, basically there was the draft for the Vietnam War, and then towards the end of it, right as I was finishing college, they decided it's really not egalitarian enough. So what we're going to do is we're going to take everybody who's who's draftable, put their birthdays in a, in, a, you know, in a hat or something, and we're gonna pick them out one by one. And as they come out, those are the people who are gonna be drafted first. Well, I came out number one. Um, so I figured my number was up. Uh, so I had to sort of play this right, and I sort of signed up for graduate school at Morgantown, West Virginia University in art. And when it came time to do the Army physical, I said to them, hey, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not in Rochester anymore. I'm in Morgantown, West Virginia. So their little bureaucracy gets moving around and they fix it up and they set the date in Morgantown. But by that point, it was Christmas vacation, and I said, hey, I'm not in Morgantown, I'm in Rochester, New York. So the bureaucracy starts moving around again, and, um, and they set it up again for Rochester. But by that point, I was back in Morgantown for a second semester. So, I, um, so that went on till the summertime. <laughs> and then, then the number is up. Uh, they got me basically. And I went in, had a physical, and I didn't have four years or seven toes so that, you know, I was, I was raw meat in their, their eyes, I guess. Um, but I figured, well, you know, since I've heard about this program where they have a guaranteed training, and if you, if you sign up for this guaranteed training, you get training and whatever, they had a whole list of things you could get training in. And I said, well, this is, this might be a good time to get some actual formal training in electronics. Because you know, I kind of liked it. So I signed up for electronics school in the Army. 
I went through basic training, got out of basic training, went to the electronics school, and waited. And then waited some more. And waited some more. And after a couple months of just doing nothing, um, they called me into the front office and said, look, we, we know you have guaranteed training in electronics, but there happened to be just a glut of people coming in trying to uh, get some schooling in this. So we will guarantee this training, but the problem is when you get out, you may be a cook or something. In other words, there was no guarantee of assignment after that. Or, we have this position open for someone who could paint and draw in Alexandria, Virginia. Seemed like a no-brainer to me. <laughs> I mean, I kind of enjoy being at, in Alexandria, Virginia more than shooting people in Vietnam, I guess. Um, so I came here, I worked in the Army Exhibit Union, and uh, basically learned how to present art. How to present art in terms of sound, they had a little sound studio, and did drawings and paintings as presentations. In other words, it was the final product that was the important thing, how it was presented to the audience. Um, how they viewed it. And then when I got out of there, I went to work for Woodrow and Lothrop as a matter and framer, and then went to the National Gallery of Art for about 10 years. And while I was at the National Gallery of Art, I um, came across, I should backtrack a little bit, um, Earlier than this, many years earlier, we uh, have, oops, there it is. Okay, um, I heard this song. Notice the piano. cream. There's a drummer, there's a bass player, and there's a guitarist. Where the hell did the piano come from? <laughs> and it was just, I don't know, for some reason, I mean, it's what everybody, every musician knows now that there was multiple tracks putting, being put down, there's overdubbing being done, but at the time it seemed like magic. Like, you know, how did they do this? Before this, Basically, recording studios, they put a microphone in the middle of the room and they gathered musicians around it. And if you were loud, you move farther away from the microphone. If you're not so loud, you move closer. Uh, but this was very different. And so I was sort of initiated to the fact that you could, you could really do some wonderful things with this sound stuff. Um, oops. And that's what I figured out, which, like I said, it's, it's, it was, it, these days it seems very naive. It seems almost comical, you know, and any kid who's 10 years old, oh, we could, we could put many tracks on this. We could just, you know, layer it on. We could make it, we can make it beautiful and just, uh, you know, it can be, oh, it's going to be so good. And we're going to put an organ over here. We're going to put, you know, timbales over here and everything. And that was, it was a total revelation to me. But still, I thought of 
like how do we present this? How do we, how do we get this across? Um, a good friend of mine who I was in the band with right in the Washington area, uh, unfortunately just died uh, recently, Robert Goldstein. He was in the Urban Verbs and um, he uh, worked for NPR for a number of years. Uh, he was playing in a band after we, our band broke up and I, he asked me, hey, can you record, I had tape recorders at the time, and he said, can you record our band? And I was, um, I was not attuned to the latest music going on in the Washington area. Uh, but I said, sure. And he was pretty forward thinking. So I recorded his band at this one place. And there was another band there that uh, uh, said, hey, do you got a reel, a tape, an extra reel? Maybe you can record us. I said, sure. And um, it was the Slicky Boys, basically. And their manager, uh, was a guy who owned a record store in Rockville who was very tuned in to what was happening in the music community. And he s said, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a, some groups I'd like to re you to record. And he brought over the Teen Idols. And um, it was revealing, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, I, was, I was, first I was shocked and then energized. And then he said, there's another group too, there's the Bad Brains that you know, we, we uh, want to record. Uh, but he didn't want to come over with them, uh, he just would rather me record them alone, I don't know why. <laughs> um, so anyway, th but listen, what they had was, and what we did, was we, we pushed our equipment way over into the red because their energy was way over into the red and the people listening to the music that they had had to get this. They had to get the fact that that was the way this band wanted to present themselves. They didn't want to present themselves pretty. They didn't want to present themselves uh, as a smooth outfit. They wanted to get you jumping. And I think their music does that. You can listen to this. It's, it's the kind that, that I think transforms the energy that they had into the audio. going on. <laughs> but um, at the, around this time, I was working at the National Gallery, like I said, 
and um, there was a um, the donors at the gallery bought prints from a place called the Tamarin Institute in Los Angeles and it was a basically a lithography workshop I know I'm skipping between the visuals and the music and the visual and the music, but it all ties in really I mean it's all it's all how this is presented the Tamarin Institute had basically was a, an institute set up to revive lithography as an art form in America because lithography was kind of dying. So they got master printers and apprentices and they brought in artists and they gave them housing and they fed them and all that stuff and they produced some really nice prints. And the people, the, the donors at the gallery, uh, they bought these prints and they were going to have, they wanted a little exhibit of them, about 50 prints or so. And none of the curators wanted to do it. So I said, well, I'll do it. You know, it's no big thing. Um, so I put this together and, and I uh, read up and I, I found out a little bit more about the Tamarin Institute. Basically how it was a workshop that was more of a, a factory-like setting than this creative nirvana that's maybe going on. It was, people came there, they worked on prints, they produced, and they went home. And they kept pumping this out, and they got some great stuff. Because everyone was focused on doing this great presentation. You do this, this is it. This is your print. You're going to do this. You're going to leave. So you better do it right. And I said to myself, well, you know, this studio I'm sort of starting, it was in my basement at the time. I want it to be the same way. I want it to be, I don't want it to be a uh, enclave of, of uh, artistic thinkers. I want the artists who come in to do the creativity. They can think about art, but I'm going to look at their art and I'm going to assess in my mind what the best way to present this to the people, to the public, to the audience. In other words, listening to the what, listening to what they have and seeing, well, you know, what's the best way to do this? And one of the things I figured out was how you dance between different extremes. You've got the singer who's emotive. You've got the reader who's just standing there. You've got the actor and you've got the announcer, the different things. You've got the subjective and the objective. You've got the people who work from the inside and people who work from the outside. And then you have the intuitive people and the technical people. And all of this, dancing between them, creates the impact, creates the punch, creates the, the connection to the audience. I'm going to play a, a little um, snip from some guys you may recognize from their voices. Um, these are young men just out of high school and they're talking about how to present a song uh, this is a practice session, so the, the audio is kind of dodgy. But uh, they basically put a boom box and they just recorded the whole practice session. And this is one of the discussions about one of the songs that they wanted to put on the album. And, it, and it, I think it shows some insight about how art should be thought about. Not just pushing it out the door, but Consider it, do it right, and then push it out the door. You have seven new ones complete, maybe nine ones, right? Like, have like, the guy comes to me at night and like, lays on like, master lyrics and immediately fit with that thread. It's a cassette. And try and, like, constantly to get ideas. Well, nine, and then cashing in. If, we, if that works out to me, I don't, cashing in to me is like, still like this. Oh man, it's like rock. 
Well, I mean, we, don't, we haven't even we haven't even practiced it. Yes, really. we have. We have. We have. <laughs> Well, I'll see how it sounds. I'm not sure I want to put it on. I want you to come off. Nah, I think it'll come off great, man. Well, yeah, it might sound real nice, but I don't want, I want the, I want it to be like, the intent to be totally understood by people. Well, it will be. Hey, what do you, well, I don't know. Because, because if there's, because if there's, how many times you're just going to look good? Because if the lyrics, if, well, even if, I don't want to put the lyrics to it, then it's, and you sing it clear enough, and it'll be, uh, because it's different, it's not, blah, blah, blah. it's not fast. I know, but I'm saying, it's not, it's not, yeah, they will, they will. Well, to me, this sounds like you're, like, you're taking the side I took on, on the out of step lyrics. Like, we're switching roles on that, except with out of step. It's fine, I it was, the lyrics, and I had that right. I, I'm not I saying the you don't lyrics. have it right. What? You said, well, no, I, I know, I'm just saying I'm No, concerned. but to me, to me, the, they're real different, because without a step, they're very, very short lyrics, very, very direct. To me, you know, they're very definitive and very, therefore, very more, more easily under, misunderstood as opposed to uh, uh, catching in, which to me is like, which to me is like opening. Fine, cut it out, man. Which is like, to me, it's like, to me it's like, it's like d definitive, like definitely sarcasm. Cashing in. What are they doing up there? Cashing in is pretty, what I say is Oh, it's so sarcastic. It is, man. It's like, like if I can put the sarcasm in the song and it sounds like I said I want to do it. I really said I want to see how it sounds, right? Well, we put it in live. No, but yeah, well, a lot of people also said well, I, they might have threatened, you know, like whatever. You know. Let's yeah, get back to well, how, but how can anybody take it serious? The, the words. Well, the, people will only take what they, what they actually hear on the record. To, well, it, it'll be there for them to for them to judge. I know, and I said I was don't judge, man. It's like so. It's a like funny as shit song. They'll be they'll figure it out. Right. And right. what if if they didn't figure out, what would they misconstrue? What could they they couldn't possibly think? Because who who says they're cashing in if they actually are? Nobody. I mean, what's? I mean, the op if it's you misunderstood, don't say how we cash in. if if they don't get the sarcasm, then what do they get? But there's no, there's no like strong statement that we would be saying. Well, who are the people who thought we were cashing in the first place? How can we cash in in general? I mean, just, just in the sense of, I mean, just as anyone who has any intelligence, how could my friend cash, cash in? As oh, come on, there's dollars. like all, that's like a very different thing. Because, no way. yes, Washington because see, it's very different in. to say, oh man, they're just getting, because we were getting back, back together because we wanted to be back together and see how far we could go with the band. And that can be seen to a lot of people as uh, they misconstrued construe something what about we the said about. They did a whole rock and roll swindle thing. That's almost admitting it. And that's just as humorous as. And they did cash in. They were admittedly swindling. And they said we are swindling. Well, I think by the bare by the bare fact of the, uh, I think that was done like pretty differently by the, the by the this. by the upbeat of the song and the. Da -da -da -da. All that stuff. We don't care. We don't care. Anyway, they've grown up. <laughs> um, but they were talking about very important thing. Uh, it was minor threat. And, uh, and they were young. I mean, they were young and they were discussing all this stuff. I mean, a lot of bands would have been, hey, listen, you know, we learned a song. Let's play it. You know, what's, what's the big deal? You know, let's just do it. Um, but they were, they were thinking about what their audience got. Very important part, what their audience got. A lot of people who come into the studio these days, um, they aren't, they want to make a CD, they want to make a, something for streaming, they want to put something on YouTube, they want to do a video. They don't think about, okay, who is your audience? And are they going to get this? Do they understand this? Am I speaking their same language? Maybe I need to modify it a little bit here and there. Maybe I need to make it a little more interesting. Sometimes, uh, sometimes a, a, a startling uh, piece really jumps out. And I'm going to skip ahead trying to figure it all out. Yes, I have been trying to figure it all out for years. Okay. Well, let's... Let me back up a little bit. Um, this is a mix that we did. There was um, 
it was the last song on the album, and they Minor Threat wanted to. They said they just just mix it. We you know, uh, Skip the guy who's underwrote the record wants to uh, wants to put it on. <laughs> it's a pretty simple song. I think the Monkees did it, the Stepping Stone or something like that. Anyway, it's, there's a lot of a uh, bunch of groups t did it. And what can we do new with the song? What can we do to make it interesting? And what I did was uh, I put a pair of headphones into a big soup pot, a big one. It was like from a clam bake. Uh, no clams or lobsters in there. And I put a microphone in there. I literally just dropped the microphone in. And, and then I, I just sort of moved stuff as it went along, starting with the, the headphones being the only source of sound, and then moving the tape into it. And you could sort of hear it. It goes from like lo-fi into hi-fi, and then drops out into lo-fi again. Got it. dumb song. It's repetitive. Um, but the main thing was trying to make it a little more interesting, basically. Uh, trying to make it so it's more listenable. And hopefully it, hopefully it did that. Anyway, I'm going to have to move along here. Um, basically, my, my, my thrust, I guess, is you get the tonality for anything and what once again whether it's music visual arts uh, comedy i mean everybody's known comedians who work on stage some connect and some just stand there and tell jokes everybody's seen that everybody's seen that in poetry slams and things like that the ones that connect connect for a certain reason and Part of that is the balance and tempering and, and the emotion they put across. They're reaching out to you rather than staying right here. They're, 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 it's almost like they're, they're going out into the audience. I'm going to skip across that. It's another Bad Brains song. But they did that um, and they, they got it. They got that their audience wanted that type of, 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 of emotion thrown at them because that was, that was the audience they were playing to. So 
really it's the sensibility and then the formation of what you have once again the sensibility is the very important part of it thinking about what you want to put across what you want to get across and who is going to receive it then you do it and you present it thank you thank you very much